In this video, we're going to examine buffer solutions and learn how to interpret titration curves. Buffer solutions are solutions that resist a change of pH, and they have to contain a significant concentration of an acid and the conjugate base. We'll talk more about what components make up a buffer in a little bit. Blood actually uses a buffer system to maintain its pH near around 7.35. If the pH rises above 7.7, .7, that's known as alkalosis, or if it drops below 7.0, that's known as acidosis, and the results can be fatal. So our body needs to maintain a consistent pH, so it uses a buffer system to do so. So in terms of ocean acidification, the pH of the ocean is between 8 and 9, um, but it's also a carbon sink, so it absorbs vast amounts of carbon dioxide. And to do so, it relies on a buffer system to maintain that pH around 7, 8 to 9. So this would be the reaction here. So carbonate plus hydrogen ions makes hydrogen carbonate. So when carbon dioxide is absorbed by the ocean, it makes carbonic acid, which dissociates to release hydrogen ions or protons, and that shifts the system to the right in this buffer system, and it reduces the amount of carbonate that's available. And because of that, it impacts coral reefs and causes them to decline because it's removing the carbonate that allows coral to build its skeleton. So buffers have two parts. They have a weak acid, and then they have a soluble salt of the acid. So this would be the example, and then this would dissociate into sodium and the, the, the anion. Any extra acid would be neutralized by that anion. So this plus this makes more of the acid plus um, water. And then any extra hydroxide that's added would be neutralized by the acid. So we've got this mixing with the hydroxide will make the anion plus water. So titration curves demonstrate the change in pH as you add more acid or base to a titration. So in a titration with a strong acid with a strong base, it will look like this. So we would have here, this is our initial amount of, um, of we have our acid solution. So it starts off around pH 1 um, because there's excess acid at this point. And then it's, you keep adding base and eventually there's a sharp increase and then it ends off around pH 13 in this case um, when there's excess base. So when we have a titration between a strong acid and a strong base, the pH at the equivalence point is 7 because the moles of acid and the moles of base will be equal to each other, meaning that it is the equal amounts of acid and base was so pH of 7. So the part of the graph that has this sharp increase right here is called the point of inflection, and this is the equivalence point. So that's when the moles of acid equals the moles of base added. And then remember, as with if it's a strong acid or a strong base, the equivalent point is 7, pH 7. In this example, we're examining a titration between a weak acid and a strong base. So in this case, as you're adding base initially, there's very little effect on the pH, um, which makes this area on the curve known as the buffer region. So any addition of base initially will not allow a change in pH. And the equivalence point right here that's when the moles of acid equal the moles of base added, is actually going to be at a pH greater than 7. And that makes sense because the acid is not dissociating fully into ions. So each mole of acid is not actually neutralizing each mole of base because of that lack of dissociation. So our equivalence point will be greater than 7. The midpoint right here, this is known as the half equivalence point. 
and that represents when half of the volume has been added to reach that equivalence point. So half the acid has been neutralized at this point. And this makes a very good buffer solution, a uh, weak acid. Um, and the pH at this point, at this half equivalence point, is also known as the, the pKa, the equilibrium constant for the acid. So if we were to look at a titration curve of a weak base with a strong acid, you'll see again there's resistance to pH change initially, so that's the buffer region. Um, then the equivalence point is less than pH of 7 because of the production of an acidic salt. So remember, um, we started off with adding acid along the way and eventually because the base isn't dissociating into ions, equal number of, of um, moles of base and acid, you will have more acid remaining, so you have an equivalence point of less than seven. Sometimes our titration curves can be actually quite complex. Um, this would be an example here. This is the titration of sodium hydroxide with phosphoric acid. And remember the phosphoric acid H3PO4 actually has it's a triprotic acid, so there's actually three equivalence points for each of the, the loss of each um, hydrogen ion in, in the dissociation of that acid. So this is the first one. So the first rapid change of pH, the pH is at 4.6 at the formation of H2PO4 minus. And then there's again this drop off. And then the second rapid change in pH at that equivalence point would be 9.7 when we formed HPO4 to minus, and then we continue on, and then there's a third rapid change in pH, that third equivalence point, that's 12.6 when we formed PO4 three minus. So we've um, dissociated the acid completely. So there's one other type of titration that you can undergo and those are known as conductometric titrations. So in this case instead of using a pH meter or an acid base indicator you would follow the conductivity over the course of the reaction. So initially um, when you had your base alone um, you would have high conductivity and as the acid and the base react the conductivity will decrease as the hydrogen and the hydroxide ions react to form water. And then the graph would take a V-shape with the point being the equivalence point, and then this portion of the graph would be, as you continue adding acids past that equivalence point, you will become more and more acidic, and then you would have more conductivity again. So a conductometric titration looks like a V with the point being the equivalence point.